Well, hello and welcome back to World War Two TV and a show on a Sunday, which is quite rare for us, but it's just to fit in with around people's schedules. And we are in Jungles Week, which is kind of a broad theme tackling actually quite a few different campaigns and theatres of war, really. But um, today we're off to talk about what we didn't talk about last time with my guest. And my guest was on the previous show talking about the Alamo Scouts with particular focus on the, the great raid that you all know about from the movie and what have you. But he was so good. So, um, so much feedback about that show. I've invited him back to tell the stories he didn't tell in that first show. So welcome back, Lance Cedric. And you are the, the Alamo Scouts go-to guy for World War II TV. Well, thank you, Paul. Thanks for having me back. I really enjoyed our first uh, episode together and it was a lot of fun and um, I hope we educated the public a little bit on the Alamo Scouts of World War II and what they did, who they were, and kind of uh, maybe the legacy that they contributed in part to the formation of, and um, ongoing operations of Special Forces uh, units in the, the U.S. and uh, Australian armies and some of the others as well. Absolutely. And, you know, and it's all about World War II in the sense of it was the birth of all the forces around the world that we now take for granted, the SAS and the commandos and the rangers and the paratroops, most of those units had their origins in World War II because of the nature of, of having to take a, a, a war back to a, a very, very strong and ruthless enemy. And it was all this way of trying to develop new techniques and new tactics. And it, and it has now led to the military changing forever, how it's focused, mm -hmm. because these units were were small and now they're now they're integral to how the American and British and Australian armies run. Special forces are 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 in a part, are a major part because our armies are smaller. But remind us for those who didn't see that first show, just talk about the, the, the great raid quickly. Just remind us the, the, the big action that the Alamo Scouts are, are famous for. Okay. Well the the Alamo Scouts performed in my research uh, some 112 identified very identifiable uh, missions during World War II, including uh, two prisoner of war camp liberations. Uh, the, the highlight being the raid on Cabanatuan, where along with Rangers and Filipino guerrillas, they liberated some 513 POWs from uh, Pangatian camp uh, near Cabanatuan on Luzon in the Philippines. There's a there's your geography lesson for you, and and. That, because they were attached with the Rangers and it was such a high profile event, really uh, thrust them in the spotlight of, uh, of military history, really, the annals of special operations. They will forever be attached with the Rangers uh, in that particular mission. So that's what they're famous for. But like any good intelligence unit, uh, a lot of times you're you don't want to be famous. You don't even want your work to be known. Uh, in many instances, it's classified. And as the Alamo Scouts started out, uh, they were classified for several months. And we're going to be talking a little bit about today one of the missions that in particular led to the Alamo Scouts being uh, brought out, if you will, by the uh, worldwide media because of the... the yeah. you know, the body of work they had accomplished in New Guinea. And this is the interesting thing about intelligence work and scouting is that if you're doing your job well, no one knows you're doing it. No one on the enemy side and no one on the allied side knows. It's just the, the planners of operations have more data at their disposal from a source they don't necessarily know where it came from. But this this is what intelligence gathering is. It's the SAS, the reconnaissance uh, corps in the British Army, these sorts of things. So, yeah, in, in some ways, the, the, the great raid, as it, as it became known, was was not was flashier and more large scale than really what units like the Alamo Scouts were known for, which is more in the kind of the stealth um, in, out, do little things. Although, of course, as we'll be discussing today, there are some quite large scale and, and, and not glamorous, but exciting <laughs> operations as well. But anyway, we're going to continue because you've provided as you did the last time a staggering amount of images which we have to thank you for sharing them with us because you, know, you, you are the as i said in the in top of the show there you have just such an uh, incredible database of photos information about the alamo scouts and i'll remind people right away folks the link to lance's website is in the description below and you can buy the pdf versions of his books direct from him and i urge you to go out there because you know it's 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 a for, uh, a part of history that 
we all deserve and should know more about. Not least of because what they did in World War II, but also the, as you said earlier, Lance, the origins of, of of special forces today. There's so much we can look back on these wartime events and see the evolution to units we know about today. But we'll we'll move on, and I'll hand over to you. I have got a bit of a cold, folks, so if I'm not on hundred percent form today, I, I'm just I mean, it's a man cold basically. I'm 52, and I like <laughs> grumbling about it, but I have got a bit of a cold. But I'll hand over to Lance, and if you've got questions for Lance or for me, we'll try and deal with them as we go along. But I'm going to hand over and jump in when I feel I have to ask things to clarify and um, and for your questions, good people of World War II TV. So over to you, Lance. All righty. Thank you, Paul. You see here a, a photograph, a, an actual period color photograph of um, the commander or the actually the director of training, Frederick W. Bradshaw, the Alamo Scouts. And the scouts were formed on November 28th of 1943 to do radar and reconnaissance work in the Southwest Pacific, uh, namely in preparation for Sixth Army landings to do amphibious uh, reconnaissance. And that would be under uh, General Walter Kruger. So uh, I just wanted to, to remind the readers what we talked about last year that the, the scouts were, because of their their need, they were an ad hoc unit, which were, which essentially means they were created for a specific purpose. And that was doing jungle and beach recon, not being used and misused as many special forces units were as uh, conventional infantry or assault troops. So really a lot of the credit goes to uh, Frederick Bradshaw, whom you see here. Now, and you see, this is Horton V. White, and he was the G2 of Sixth Army. So to this point, I'm going to move you, you can see the, I have to look here, um, 13 March, 1944. Now, fast forward, the scouts had only conducted two reconnaissance missions, one on Los Negros, which was their first on 29 February, which really kind of validated the, the unit and their concept going in by Rub BBY flying boat, uh, paddling ashore, doing a recon, being essentially 10 feet away from their the people they are they are reconnoitering and, and observing and getting back out undetected. Another was uh, on the Malay River on actually on New Guinea, um, where the team almost was killed by our own bombers. They weren't expected to be a few hundred miles behind enemy lines, which was part of the danger of this concept. Um, as a reminder, the scouts were formed in six to seven man teams, usually led by an, a lieutenant, and the team would take on the, the last name of the officer. Okay, so up to this point, uh, G2 had requested a reconnaissance, the scouts to go in ahead of time in the Hollandia area, which was a um, now known as Jarapura, is it was Dutch Hollandia, and it was midway up the coast of New Guinea, which effectively was almost a some 600 mile jump from Finchhaven, kind of where they had been uh, operating from. So all in part of MacArthur's strategy to leapfrog, uh, leaving units, Japanese units, specifically the 18th Army under General Adachi, um, isolating them, allowing them to quote. Um, wither on the vine so here and you just, see just to jump in lance is that yeah. it reminded me last night in a show with brian dimitrovich about guadalcanal is that if i remember correctly the japanese the Jap the american marines were using maps copied from the japanese who copied them from the british navy or something like that and the point is that a lot of the maps of these islands throughout the pacific were, were naval maps that was where it, they were navigation points and we didn't have the topogra topographical information about some of these arts. We didn't know what was actually beyond kind of the shoreline, so to speak, which is part of the reason I'm guessing that units like the Alamo Scouts and Marine Raiders were, were invented because we, we need that information. We, we know where the islands are. We know where they sit, but we don't know enough about topography and geography and, 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 and fauna and fauna as well. So um, the, we forget those of us who are ETO focused like myself, where mm -hmm. everywhere we go, there are 125,000 scale maps, all the bridges and stuff marked on them and church towers is that the Pacific is a very different entity and knowledge of, of the enemy and knowledge of terrain and knowledge of everything else comes from aerial photos and, and from actually putting boots on the ground. And we covered that 
in the first show, the, you know, the, the actual basic need for an, uh, the allies to have better information about where they're going uh, in the future campaigns. Yes, and that, that was the bane of every planner because many were operating off old German uh, missionary maps that had been drawn in, in the late 19th century. And not only was the translation difficult in many instances because the, the place names had been changed or renamed depending on who was operating in the area because there was a there was a um, really a land grab going on in New Guinea is if, if anyone studied that would know that there were different colonial powers competing for um, for the, the resources in the New Guinea especially in the Northwest and, and to your point Paul you'd mentioned about um, the reconnaissance deficit well Incidentally, the unit that the Alamo Scouts took over their camp on Ferguson Island, the Navy Amphibious Scouts, well, they were led by a, a commander, William Coltus, who had posed as a bird watcher in New Guinea before the war, doing these very same types of, of, of reconnaissance and map making and so on. He's actually working for the military under undercover. So I think wow. maybe... Maybe the smell was in the wind a little bit. So yeah, like, well, we have like, the Australian Coast Watchers and things like that. There's, mm -hmm. there's, there is there is a precedent for having people who have local knowledge because that is where you get the extra information from. But um, I digress a bit. But it's just I'm, I'm reminding folks that, that the Pacific is a long, a large place with many, many islands. Our mm -hmm. knowledge of it today, when we can go on Google Earth and just hover over a place and see it, is very different to World War II when information was was much harder to, to acquire. Well, you see here on the slideshow, uh, again, this is uh, Russ Blaze, the the director of the Alamo Scouts Historical Foundation, again, doing a great colorization, um, really kind of makes some of these, these black and white photos pop, and hopefully it'll yep. catch some of our younger, newer viewers who, who might not believe that history actually did happen in color instead of black and white. <laughs> yeah. So here's in preparation for the Hollandia landings. You can see Kruger to the left standing there observing what was going on. Okay, now you see here is, is a map that Russ worked up of the landing area of Operation Reckless, which was the code name of the Hollandia landing. Now you see uh, to your left, as your viewers see, Tanamara Bay. Um, we had Thompson team and Reynolds team two teams earmarked to work that area, and again, to, to scout out the bays and look for uh, targets of opportunity, enemy escape routes, uh, what have you. Over here to the right or to the east, you'll see Hollandia itself, and in, this, in Humboldt Bay especially, and then Tammy Drome, you'll notice, which is an airdrome. And the other two scout teams, Sambar and Hobbs, whom I'll be speaking about shortly, uh, their mission essentially was to recon that area, um, check out the airfield, make sure that it was uh, um, either operational or non-operational, either could or uh, could not be used against us in any form during the landing. So there you see the, the general makeup. It's a really it's a nightmare if you're on foot uh, at the time because of rains and such. Uh, waist deep mud was not uncommon. We'll have a photo of that here a little later. Um, and we're going to come up to, of course, talk about Goya later on. Uh, mm -hmm. That's an important part of the show. But yeah, we'll we'll keep on moving. And um, and that's where we are in relation to the New Guinea there. So thanks for a nice overview map there, so people can keep up with their geography. Yeah, it, like I said, it uh, when I first started working with the Alamo Scouts, and and I was. Uh, you know, completely ignorant. I was talking to Robert Sumner, who was the director of the association way back in 93. And and here you have New Guinea, which is a bird, and the Vogelkop, which is German or Dutch for bird's head. And I'd been working for like two or three months before it dawned on me. Hey, that's what Vogelkop means. You know, it was a nightmare to to sort out all the different place names. So if if the viewers feel a little lost, don't worry. You're not alone. Here's a, a, a photo, a colorized photo of the landing. As you can see, not a whole lot of beach area. and It was essentially an unopposed landing. Uh, um, the Japanese, in many instances, realized they could not meet 
the, the, the sheer amount of troops and weaponry at the beach. So what they did, they would uh, retreat back in and, and fight when the, the terrain was more advantageous to them or sis, using systems of tunnels and caves and whatnot. The, the, frankly, the standard Japanese way by the time you get to yes. 1944, 45, the mm -hmm. retreat in land, use tunnels and, and use, the, use the ground that they were familiar with to their advantage. Mm -hmm. yeah, there's an aerial you can see. I, I mean, it, it's not a day's hike to go across those mountains. <laughs> Picture to the left, Tanamara Bay, Tanamara Bay area, and then the, the docks there in the Humboldt Bay area where the landings were made. Right here, you'd see one of the, if it might be one of only a half a dozen photographs of an Alamo scout team in action. And this would have been um, Reynolds team. Someone war photographer clicked a photo and there we go. You see the, the camouflage that they wore, the soft caps, uh, um, M17, A1 folding stock carbine or the M1, a little bit of the weaponry. So that's the way they looked. Not the guy in the helmet that's helping them <laughs> helping with the landing. The scouts never wore helmets except in camp. Right there's just an old morning report really kind of showing the the uh, where some of the scout teams, these two or three teams, four teams, um, as they were at headquarters and where they were going to go. Those are the old morning reports that provide a uh, treasure trove of information for historians. Yeah, historians and love morning reports and after action reports. That's the, that's the fuel to our our research <laughs> and uh, and just adding the fact that we're so grateful that so much of this stuff is being digitalized and shared now because the the dark old days of the eighties and nineties when I started, everything was done <laughs> by mail, and I, I can't imagine how in comparatively easy it'll be for the next generation of historians to put the work together because they'll have a international connectivity with other historians their things will be online digital will just send off pdfs back and forth by email and uh, mm -hmm. it, it's a, it must be a wonderful time for the young the, when i have the young guests on who are in their early 20s studying world war ii they don't know how lucky they are to have <laughs> so much at their fingertips that just kind of wasn't available when I started doing stuff 30 years ago. But anyway, I, I digress again. <laughs> and to the left here, you see a colorized photo of uh, team leader George Thompson. And to the right, um, that is a, a multi-service team. I colorized that photo of, uh, of several 6th Army and 5th uh, Air Force personnel, engineers. They were doing a special mission by submarine on this and I'll, I'll refer back to this one a little bit later, but you can see the composition of uh, the teams and the outfits they wore and kind of get a, get a feel for the guys, especially the guys in back. Yeah, and and you know we we talked about in the first show it's 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 about comfort and practical mm -hmm. practical uh, getting through the jungle. It's not about smart. It's not about looking consistent. It's about fitting into the environment and using their special skills. And if if you if you want to go back, folks, you haven't seen that first show, go back and you'll learn all about how they acclimatize to the conditions and the dietary needs and the physical fitness. It's a it was a fascinating insight into how to create a body of men capable of going into these. Frankly quite hostile environments. And I don't mean hostile in terms of the enemy. I mean hostile in terms of just the just the conditions uh, of, of disease and creepy callies and all that kind of stuff. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah. And here you see Woodrow Hobbs. He was one of the the two team leaders. Uh, he and Sambar, they, they paired up in the landing in the Hollandia area. So just colorized shots of, of those guys or of him. And next, this is Mike Sombar, a black and white and color photo, nicknamed Iron Mark or Iron Mike. His uh, parents had had immigrated, actually escaped from Russia in the early days of the communist revolution. Actually, uh, around 1913, 14, they were wealthy landowners and were being threatened. So uh, the, the his mother and a couple of siblings got out and then. Uh, father followed. So he was uh, renowned for being very tough. One scout who was tough in his own right said that uh, he challenged him one day and he said, uh, next thing I knew I was flat on my back with a sore jaw. He said uh, um, <laughs> he was every bit the character of a, of a, of a tough 
uh, brawling man who fit his nickname. Super. Another morning report showing some of the some of the scouts and where they're headed. Okay, here are a couple members of the uh, of the team. David Milda, you will see to the left, an American Indian from uh, Bapshula, Arizona, and Charles Harkins from um, New York. And the reason I put these these two men together is after they left the Alamo Scouts, um, they were two of of a handful of men who were actually killed in combat after they left the Alamo Scouts. And Milda was killed in the opening week of the invasion of uh, Luzon, and Harkins was killed on Lay Day on the last week of combat there. And here you have to the left uh, uh, Jay Roberts and Aura Davis, also members of the team. One colorized, one not. Just to put some faces, William Lensing, who was a actually a Dutch interpreter who went on this particular mission that we're going to be talking about. And then to the right, a stock photo that I that I located giving an idea of what the mud was like in the Hollandia area uh, during this mission. And, and yeah, the, we you can never have enough images of just showing the harsh conditions of the Pacific, you know, whether it's New Guinea or Iwo Jima or the Burma. You know, we, we need to be reminded just how difficult it is for, for anything to happen there, let alone fighting, just bringing up supply, just moving, just frankly, keeping hydrated is such a difficult difficulty in these areas. And and yeah, these photos are so important, conveying just how grim it is out there. That's fantastic. That the, the, I'm, I'm going I'm digressing again, but that is that the camouflage on that is in that. I know it's colorized, but it's just yeah, it's really stark quality these images they're they're so good lance we're so grateful that you you share us this stuff so back back to back to jungle conditions again yeah this is this is a training shot taken from the the first training class of a 26 mile jungle hike so uh, up a up and down a mountain and pretty tough and really good quality taken by us army signal corps photographers so notice none of the men are smiling so 26 mile hike and I I can tell you from experience that's not easy. <laughs> yeah, 26 miles is not it's not fun in any environment but in 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 these conditions it's it's yeah. And if we're it's saying not fun with Reebok tennis shoes yeah, on yeah. and <laughs> gym shorts. The day of the London marathon today. So it was 26 miles in London a friend of mine Andy did the entire run wearing first world war British Army surge uniform and webbing, like an idiot. But uh, <laughs> but Charity didn't wear the hobnail boots. He wore trainers. He wore World War One uniform to draw attention to uh, the, the the sacrifice of the World War One uh, sure. generation. So yeah, four hours and seventeen minutes. I think he did it in, which is pretty mm. amazing. Giving his did it in the uniform anyway. I digress again. It's probably the medication, folks. It's the, it's the, it's the aspirin right. I have. And what you see and. In- I probably have this a little out of order. I'm going to have to look at this one. And it, uh, okay, questionnaires that were given to some of the missionaries by Japanese, by the Japanese. And and I'm going to I'm going to set this up here in a little bit of uh, when we get to this aspect of missionaries. And that's going to come a little bit into the mission. Super. Okay. All right. Now here. <clears throat> Here's a Dr. Theodore and Hattie Braun. They were Americans. They had been um, in New Guinea since the 1920s. And Dr. Braun here, uh, shown later performing a sur- surgery. This is a, a colorized photograph. This is a pre-war photo. So please keep this photo in mind as we go on. All right. Uh, this uh, a Sister Atonia, actually from about an hour and a half from where I live and about five miles were, uh, from where a- Alamo Scout Andy Smith grew up, incidentally. To the right, William Sievers, who left a wonderful diary recounting the events that, that the missionaries who are going to be spoken about here uh, encountered. So keep those people in mind as well. Okay, Andrew Mild and uh, to the left, an American missionary and to the right uh franciscus wolf who is a german missionary again both of those are colorized photographs well this is the film now 
Okay, what we have here is a little film clip taken by the Signal Corps of the rescue of certain uh, nuns and missionaries during the Hollandia operation. So please. I'll, I'll play that. It's got sound, folks. So I'll play that now. Glaring indictment in the Japanese record are these pictures of rescued missionaries and nuns, starved and emaciated after their long ordeal in Japanese hands. German and American missionaries were treated alike with brutal harshness. Forced to labor for the Japanese, they were finally abandoned and left to die. The Japanese are no respecters of women. These gentle nuns were forced to do hard labor forced to fetch and carry by Japanese officers. They suffered many other worse indignities. But in Jap hands, there still remain many thousands of Australian, British, American, Canadian, and Indian men and women. There will be no rest for the Japanese until they all are free. And this was a film clip that we recovered, that Russ and I recovered during a research trip to the National Archives and really kind of fits in with the, exactly with what we're talking about today. Again, a photo of the, of the nuns following the liberation. This would have been taken on or about April 26th of 1944. Right, so um, <clears throat> um, are we still there, Lance? Yeah, yeah. So we, I'll put the next photos up. So we got, we got, still got photos there. So we, we, yeah. are we going to explain um, the, the nature of the rescue then? I think. Yes. Yeah, so what I'm going to do is now you've seen you you have some some idea, the viewers of, of what these people came out looking like. Well, first of all, why were they there? Well. There had been a, a, a missionary presence in New Guinea since the 1900s. When the war broke out, there were effectively about a thousand missionaries of all different denominations. There were Catholics and Lutherans and uh, Society of the Divine Word. Um, a lot of souls needed saving. A lot of uh, a lot of, uh, of natives native souls needed converting. So, what better place? Than New Guinea, so that's what was going on when the when the Japanese invaded, or when they declared war, rather in December 7, 1942, um, the the alarm went out that hey things aren't going to go well in New Guinea. I think the people knew kind of an idea that New Guinea would be um, in the way or on the way to Australia. At least they feared that, that would. That would be the case. Well, um, when the when the Japanese landed um, a month later, the word was uh, Aust the Australian government said all of our men and women, except of uh, doctors and nurses on active missionary service, uh, come back home, get out. So the the Japanese landed uh, around the Madang area, which mm -hmm. is near Weewak, and and it was. It was the number one area for malaria in the world. Wow. So you can imagine the environment. That, that, that gives you an idea how, how bad things were. So once the Japanese landed, they, they collected a lot of these missionaries because they were, they were afraid they would be uh, providing information to the Allies, which, of course, they would in one form or the other. But many of these missionaries were German. 
but the Japanese distrusted them as well. So again, they were all herded together and they, they had a collective faith um, central to anything they were doing was, was their, their religious faith. So uh, for the next couple of years, uh, these people really endured a lot of hardship. Uh, uh, they would grow gardens and such to try to provide for some of their own food. But as the Japanese were increasingly being cut off with the Allied advance, um, the Japanese would be taking advantage of their, or taking over their native gardens. The uh, medical care was essentially uh, gone. They could, if they could barter or trade for some minor medical care, they would. Um, that Dr. Braun, recall he and his wife, of course they had some medical people there, but you know, without medicine, as especially um, Adabrin, and those quinine and those sorts of things that are going to fight against uh, malaria, um, the going was pretty rough. So in February of 1944, the Japanese loaded up um, 156 of these missionaries on a barge, the Dorish Maru, and American planes attacked thinking it was on a Japanese barge. That's because that's how the Japanese were resupplying and with, with barges, mainly at night. But um, this happened to be during the day and killed about 70 of these missionaries. And they were in a horrible state and along with several Japanese soldiers. So they had made their way inland near Goya and they were being held and they were becoming an increasing uh drain on the Japanese who were trying to escape inland as best they could from the the allied invasion of Hollandia. So hope all that's clear. <laughs> Next slide, please. Okay. I, these, this is just another photo of, of other displaced uh, personnel after the Hollandia landing, not missionaries. Okay. This is General Eichelberger to the right who was commander of I-Corps under, within 6th Army. And uh, I believe um, a favorite of General MacArthur. And you can see uh, Merlin Spencer. Now keep that name uh, forefront of your mind because he's the one who actually broke the news of the Alamo Scouts in, in, a, in a national, in a three-part national story in October of 1944. So Merlin uh, was actually on the invasion right and he got to learn of the rescue of these nuns which we'll get into even more okay next one all right you'll see at the the center there the man with the beard he's one of the, the liberated missionaries and i think he was in the film i thought well, there was, yes, he was. The, with the beard i think it was him yeah mm -hmm. okay and another shot it was taken probably from that film a little boy with a large shoes, color eyes, another shot. And then again, these are just outstanding photos, Lance. So such such good quality. So that, that you've got so many photos about what in the grand scheme of things is a relatively obscure action in World War II. It's just incredible. We I've done entire shows on better known events where we have three photos. You would have shown right. photo after photo after photo and film. It just it's a, it's a testament to the research work you and the Alamo Scouts as a historical society have done to put all this stuff together. It's just incredible that we're getting Thank you. sharing it with us. You'll notice there that is Dr. Braun and his wife. Yeah. And it, if you recall that earlier photo, that pre-war photo, they're in a bad way. And they, they suffered for several months, especially uh, Mrs. Braun, almost died. She was in such a bad way. But, okay, next one. All right, there you can see how uh, emaciated she is. Yeah. Both of them. Now, if you just hold it right there, Paul, um, so we talked about the missionaries a little bit, but what about the mission? Well, simply it was, it was a very quick mission, which led to all this. So in essence, the scout teams landed and they arrived on April 22nd. 
stay the night on the ship. The next day they were supposed to go in. There was a snafu, as oftentimes happens. They said, well, we don't want you going in by rubber boat. We're going to take you in by LCV, which is landing craft vehicle, big, large boat, similar to that. Well, they took the rubber boat away. They said, no. Oh, then, then they said, well, we can't land yet. Okay. Scouts were getting madder all the time. Finally, two days later, they, they got on got aboard or got on land and they were given their mission. So they went to conduct the mission at Tammy Drome. The other Thompson and Reynolds con conducted theirs by Tanamara Bay. So they're doing their thing and they're they're researching this or uh, reconnoitering Holokang Beach in the inland a little bit where it was reported that Japanese were escaping. So Sambar and Hobbs did the beach, and they split up. Sambar's team went south a little bit, a few miles, and discovered a, a, or saw a horse outside of the hut. Saddled horse. And what's going on here? Well, th and this was really about the only action. They, they, they snuck up to the thatched hut, looked inside. There was a Japanese officer standing there getting dressed. Well, Sambar pulled the pin on a grenade, threw it through the window. Grenade went off. He rushed in. The guy was still standing there, <laughs> miraculously. So he knocked him down with a right to the jaw and then shot the man. So that's about the only action they had. Well, they continued on for another hour or so, and then they encountered some natives. He said, hey, there's about 120 125 white missionaries further further south. I said, okay, well, at that point, um, Sambar picked a couple of the stronger ones to go with him, picked Harkins and, and Lensing and, and Davis, or Roberts rather, and they went um, about six miles through that knee-deep mud that you saw. Wow. Now imagine how tough that would be. And essentially, they they ran into three missionaries who were who had been sent out. They were all very weak, looking to uh, make contact with American forces because the missionaries knew that there had been some kind of attack. They could hear the 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 artillery going off yeah. and, and the naval activity and, and aircraft <clears throat> activity. So. They went further toward the missionaries, and what they did they discover? A Japanese officer sleeping. They woke him up. Well, actually, he was an interpreter, a naval interpreter. Well, Sambar wanted to take care of business, but they got orders that, hey, you know what? Take him back. We want that prisoner. So they captured this man. Made their way to the, made their way back to the beach, or near the beach. Sent word to the 41st Infantry Division to a battalion of them. Hey, we have missionaries, and they sent sent a battalion the next morning to come save uh, 120 some missionaries, with 13 being Americans, and some 40 nuns, a Polish missionary, um, a couple Australians, and the rest were Germans. So that's the rescue. And the, the people that you saw on the on the screen and in the film clip, those who those were the rescuees. Well, that's all fine and good. Sambar and Hobbs and Thompson and Reynolds, they went on, conducted other reconnaissance uh, of, of the area for the next couple of weeks. Well, back to 456, you see LST, landing ship troop. That was the, the vehicle of repatriation and rescue, so to speak, for the missionaries. They were loaded onto this boat. And this man, uh, I contacted him. I found a roster. He happened to live about an hour from me, named Leland Hofer. And he told all about the, the transporting of the missionaries. Now they had services on the bow of the ship. And, and contrary to what was reported, that many had been molested. And it was his 
it was his belief that the the nuns and and the others were told not to report this and the, the military the same because it would only infuriate the american soldiers who would be gun happy as it was to get it more japanese and they needed japanese prisoners and, was, and there's precedent from that, Lance, because when yes. we did the show with Carl James, I think it was about the Kokoda track, uh, which is also in New Guinea, of course, and that the mm -hmm. Australian nurses there, I guess that was two years earlier, okay. there had been some horrible incidents there that were kind of hushed up for that very reason, that they didn't, they didn't want to instill um, blind hatred in Australian troops because revenge is never a good motivation for keeping soldiers um organized and doing their jobs in a in a proper cautious manner it's it's a you want them you want them to be focused but you don't want people going in there angry so although in the world we live in today in 2021 in the me too environment it's important to understand the brutality and and i can kind of understand at the time why some of these incidents were 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 covered up in the sense of of, of get a, there's a war to win at the moment there's a war to win the, the tragedy i suppose would be about the fact that they often were kept they, they were never revealed ever it was the, the there should have been a time when it was revealed and sometimes it, these these stories got lost in the midst of time a bit well and i and to that point paul i think a lot of a lot of them it was, it was a different time and they just there was probably a lot of shame involved and and yeah. The prisoners were debriefed. They were actually the interpreter, the translator and interpreter service and uh, interrogators and such. Uh, they were pretty thorough, especially with um, uh, interrogating Braun and his wife and others because they had actually served and been around German missionaries. Mm -hmm. Actually, they yeah. were a minority and, and Braun being of, of, of German descent. So... You know, a little bit of hyper vigilance of the time, and we have some of those documents, so you, you can see you know, what was going on. I think it was it was more mistreatment than than um, the isolated or the occasional um, rape, and but there there was there were several murders, outright decapitations mm -hmm. and such, which we're going to touch on here in a little bit. Uh, and there okay. is the bow of the LST, yeah. Yes, and there are the nuns. Actually, they were they were taken from Hollandia to Finchhaven. So that was a going a jump going back east to a, a rear base, and they many of them were treated there for uh, four or five weeks. Uh, the bronze were, and then later on they were transported to uh, additional medical facilities in Brisbane. You can see them in the hospital there, uh, the man the second from the left and the third. It, it, all the men in robes are actually um, um, prisoners, former prisoners. I guess some colorized photos we did of, of those prisoners. Ray Barber to the right was actually an Australian. And he was in the film clip, you can you mm. recall that. All right, and, and for the mission uh, later on, uh, Sambar and Lensing and the other two men, uh, Roberts and Harkins, they were awarded the Silver Star for that particular mission. But um, very, very vague. It was not mentioned that they were Alamo scouts. It was just for actions in New Guinea. Because remember, the scouts weren't public knowledge yet. Yeah, still secret. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Okay, and there, there you can see th this there's, is there's Merlin Spencer's um, yes. press release essentially. Yeah, yeah. Well, this one it, actually, you see, it's dated April 28th, but they were the first Americans to be freed by armed forces, and it says 99 white persons, 24 half castes, which basically you understand what that is. It's just uh, biracial, um, and. The patrol stayed with the party that night. You'll see that there was Michael Sambar of Wyoming, Delaware. Doesn't mention anything about Alamo Scouts. It says patrol scouts. Right, yep. And then, yep. But Spencer would later in October come out with a 
with a three-part series went national just on the Alamo Scouts. That was their coming out party. And you can see here, this is a, um, a, a German postcard from the Red Cross after they they were um, liberated, basically saying, uh, I'm good here. <laughs> Everything's good. Next one. There's one in, in uh, Polish, a Polish missionary. Was able to access these at the National Archives. The problem was is finding where to look. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that's half the battle with the archives. The stuff is there. It's knowing where to look for it. Is the, Absolutely. Yeah. There's the uh, evacuee list from Hollandia. Basically, the, the first group of people you see there of nine, uh, with the exceptions of the Browns and, and one other person, were the Americans. Yeah, yeah. Going to see their, their hometowns. Okay. And that is... Uh, okay, mm -hmm. letters, letters sent to or talking about what was going on. Mr. Mild, um, patriated, da-da-da, um, who he was, kind of a, just a recap of the, the ship they were on, what they were suffering from, malaria, beriberi, and, uh, and myriad other, other things. Um, again, looking into the, the welfare of, of the missionaries, and just uh, again, I want to commend you, Lance, and your and your association and society for for doing this kind of work. Because you know, we said in the first show, you you have and that you have interviewed lots of Alamo scouts. You've got to meet them and understand what their experiences are. And there are books out there on other units based almost entirely on oral histories, which can be good, but they can also be problematic yes. because memories fade, memories get confused, stories get get mixed up, and it's it's always imperative to cross check the recollections mm -hmm. of the people who were there with actually what the after action reports, the Maureen reports and what these, these information is, is in the documents. And, and then you can provide that much better at the end of it. And it's, it, you know, I, we've talked about it before in World War II TV, we are in this era with these last few veterans around where we're hanging off every word they say because they are incredibly important and they're national treasures, but there's also the need to still be, uh, objective about it and look at what they're saying and has their story got different over the years go back and check it what they were even the even the person himself what were they saying 20 years ago has the mm -hmm. has the number of tiger tanks increased over the years that kind <laughs> of scenario that we've all been part of and so yeah it's, i just again commend you for your your outstanding work in in just putting this together from all these different sources it's just incredible thank you and it, it what you just said paul it, it goes to show like any old athlete the older i get the better i was so the same applies <laughs> to the war stories um what we try to do is and, and i have thousands of pages of, of actual oral history um i try to find a, an account the that will corroborate that account and then yeah. i'll use it or a document better yet something that was published at the time by a different source and three better yet so it is it's better and better as the more the more evidence that you can present okay and here we have um okay now we get into the the other half or the other part of the story which really in in many ways is is more fascinating you see here that we have finds by Nisei interrogators of that Japanese naval officer that was captured. Now, his name was um, Akunio Yunomi, and he had he had gone to or attended college in Canada and saw himself as a, as a pretty uptown type of guy. Well, you see, um, he became of interest because when he was captured by Mr. Sambar, Lieutenant Sambar, Sambar recovered a diary and he, Sambar said, well, I didn't really think much of it. I stuffed it in my pocket and went on doing what I was doing. And then I reached in my pocket a couple of days later, said, wait a minute. Oh, I got this, I got this, uh, this diary. I better turn this thing in. So he turned it over to Sixth Army Intelligence and what it revealed was a horrifying. Now you see here in this, this document to the right, and I want to bring this up. It's 
Allied Translator Service. It indicates that you know me, beheaded an Allied prisoner of war on 24 October 43. Kind of gave the date, and it, it was in the man's own handwriting. Now, if you scroll down a little bit, Paul, you'll notice the person behind this was one Melvin Purvis. Now, that name may ring a bell with some people. He was J. Edgar Hoover's number one um, most wanted hunter. That means John Dillinger, Babyface Nelson, Pretty Boy. I've, I've seen him portrayed in film. As soon as I saw the <laughs> name there, I thought, yeah, he's he's been he's in the uh, the lexicon of Hollywood uh, um, prohibition gangster movies. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so he he was you see Colonel Jag and over the War Crimes Office wanting to push this further. And, and actually, he was uh, Purvis uh, took part in the Nuremberg War Trials yeah. later over in Europe. Okay, next one. Okay, now here, here you see that the, the colorize Russ did a magnificent job colorizing this photo. I can't tell you. I mean, many of you have probably seen this photo before, but here you have a, an Australian team that was working behind the lines, a radio team, and they were an um, Australian Dutch uh, pipe, pumping out information. Uh, they were captured. And you can see clearly the Seaflet, Seaflet is the man's name to the left, has a uniform on. Well, and, and the man in the middle was actually working for them as well. This was the, the man who was beheaded by Yunomi. Now, this is not Yunomi you see in the photo. This was, I believe, the executioner of Seaflet. Next one. This is Kunio Yunomi. This Anybody who's who's studied warfare in the Pacific has seen this photograph. It is infamous. It was recovered actually not on Yunomi, but on another Japanese officer in some other location. The negatives were on him. But there was some kind of uh, identifying information that linked it to Yunomi. And if I may, this is what you know me wrote and was translated. This afternoon was for me an occasion to be remembered for a lifetime. I myself, with my own Japanese sword, beheaded an enemy soldier prisoner. This was a new experience for me, but I screwed myself up to it. Anything can be done if one is asked to do it to the very best of one's ability. And I felt a complete conviction that I could perform this feat properly. I believe that I was magnificent. Amongst the Japanese onlookers, there are many who declare their admiration for my skill in making such an excellent stroke. Wow. Well, one could imagine the impact this had. Yeah, I mean, just for some context here, I'm going to be having um, uh, Lynn, Lynette Silver back on at some point, the Australian historian, because she wrote about we had one the first time to talk about Operation Jaywick, the uh, the um, the junk they took into Singapore Harbor. But she's mm. coming back on at some mm -hmm. other point to talk about Rimau, the second raid into Singapore where the Australian Z Force team ended up on a in, in a similar place. They ended up on, on an island with some rather nasty Japanese there who ended up beheading a number of them. And and if I'm remembering correctly, and I'll wait till Lynette comes back on to, to to elaborate on it again. It came down to an English speaking Japanese interpreter who had kept the records that ended up providing the evidence. Mm -hmm. and I think this was possibly 30 years after war if it, or something to, 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 to bring war crimes trials against these people because then as we know, so few Japanese were ever captured alive. So little information was ever taken from the battlefield to ever corroborate anything. And the thing is, as, as angry as the Allies were about war crimes, justice needs evidence. To, to, to convict anybody of war crimes, you need to have an open and shut case with evidence. And as we know, when it comes to some of the Japanese war crimes, there just wasn't, there wasn't any evidence. There was only, uh, well, I mean, there was evidence, but not enough ev evidence for a conviction. Mm -hmm. And so th these kind of statements are, you know, you, they are incredibly important. Yes. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, you, you can see here a, a actual copy of his of his diary. 
that Sambar recovered. Wow. Now here is Yanomi himself, and this is a colorized version of his uh, latter years in college, I believe, and the actual page of which that, that translation was made from. Melvin Purvis again, and that letter. You can see that's May of 1945. It didn't take him long. Once they realized what they had, so let's get this ball rolling, and they did. Okay, this, and again, this is a document that was his, his was Unomi's um, college transcript, in essence, his information card. Um, you can see, and, and I wrote a story that appears in this issue of recon, uh, essentially um, outlining the whole story of Yanomi, his, his college career, his travels in Japan. He, he sang for a band. He was, he was in business with a coffee grower, all the, this, this long and winding road that took him from Japan to South America, up to Canada, and then back to Japan and into New Guinea. And then, and where we'll see he's going now. That's his college photo, by the way. There's a fascinating conversation in the sidebar, Lance, about you know evil and how can people do such horrific things. And you know, we did the show with um, Dr. Philip Blood recently about the Luftwaffe in the in the in the Ukraine. And and actually, tragically, a lot of these people involved in this are actually very normal. They're, they're, they are they yeah. are part of the the mechanism, but whether you would define them as evil, we, we can easily use those words to describe them. When you actually analyze who these people are, they had often had normal lives before. They some those that weren't brought to justice, they had normal lives afterwards. And mm -hmm. and, and and they don't necessarily fall into the category of the of the of the psychotic serial killer that we, we kind of want them to be. Their their very normality is actually what is sometimes more scary about them is that they, they, I don't think they are. They're doing evil things, and people may argue, but I, they're, they're, it's, it's actually the normality about them that is, it is very, very scary. Yeah, they drank the Kool Aid, in, in essence. Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it's a fascinating insight, and 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 the more I study what the, the history of, the, of World War Two, the more I'll never understand the actions behind some of these barbaric, barbaric acts. But you. Because yes, you know, as you say, we talked about other shows. You you want evil, you want horrible people to be psychotic. You say, oh well, he's just mad. Mm -hmm. He's just he's deranged. He's he's a psychopath. He's 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 got a screw loose. Whatever metaphor phrase you want to use, but actually, you find that a lot of them aren't. A lot of them are just uh, bureaucrats in some ways. Yeah. But anyway, we're going down. You don't want him to be your neighbor next door. If you could blow that yeah. up a little bit, Paul. If I could look at that just yeah. a little bit. Okay, you see the. Uh, the interrogation report basically gives the down and dirty. Um, the man that he, Raharan was the man actually that uh, was uh, executed. Wow. By Yanomi. And there, there's the basic, basic rundown on Yanomi. Um, the interrogation report and such. And they did a real quick history. Um, Canada was very good about getting as much information as they could. Okay, next slide, please. Now, after the war, there, there were a series of Japanese war crimes trials. They were held in you know, a Rabal. They were, they were held many different places, depending on the level of criminal you were. So, Yanomi was in the system. He was held at a, a variety of different camps. And um, actually, uh, you can find, well, I have the, the transcripts from the trial. Um, only took about 15 years to find, but <laughs> actually have them. Um, it's it was pretty matter of fact, and, and I think um, he basically said uh, I was doing what I was told. The the age old uh, plausible deniability. Hey, you know what? I I was told to do it. Uh, an argument the Germans made very strongly. At Nuremberg. Uh, next slide, please. Okay. Um, Again, there's his own statement, his signature. And okay, next one. Um, one thing I didn't, I must have missed it, but in his trial in 1947, he was sentenced to death. 
he and, and many others? Well, he actually um, turned, not for the lack of a term, state's evidence, mm -hmm. <laughs> in, in essence, on some of the other, other um, officers who had committed crimes. And he got a stay, and it was reduced to like 20 years. And then all of a sudden, along comes the Korean War. Now, what's that have to do with anything? Well, we're in occupied Japan. That is our staging, our staging point for the Korean War. All of a sudden, we begin taking a little bit more of a, of a, uh, a softer approach for the government of Japan. And all of these marginal wartime criminals... So there begins to be a, a, a subtle movement to release some of these people. Well, um, as one might imagine, he ended up in Sagamo Prison outside of Tokyo, and he was from Tokyo, and um, no record that I can find, um, being limited, not speaking Japanese, or reading Japanese is, is, is really difficult. However, we did find out that he was released as a general, uh, in a general release of lower level war criminals, basically as a way of um, being a, I think it was a thank you to the Japanese for allowing us to be there. In essence, we were an occupying army that, that um, we ended occupation, although we still stayed there. And you know me, basically uh, went free. Well, I did find his immigration paperwork, and he kept his name, and he went, if you'll go back one, he went to um, Brazil. Now, he had been in Brazil right after college in, on business, so it, apparently the boys of Brazil just weren't mm -hmm. Germans. They were also Japanese. Yeah, and I'm just going to say, Lance, it's, you know, my we're, we're, we're very aware of the deals being struck in 45 and 46 mm -hmm. in the ETO because, you know, the Cold War has begun, the Russians are now our enemies and various, as you say, they're kind of le le lesser criminal Nazis are sometimes mm -hmm. being released or used or given positions because there's a new war to, 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 to deal with. And I, I was aware of the ETO. I, I have to say, this is kind of news to me that but although it makes sense, yeah, because the Korean the Korean War, of course, is an, is now pressing, is now an, is is more important in the early 51, 52 than World War Two was, which was now in the past. So I can understand, although not forgive, let's say, but I can understand yeah. deals have to be made. There's a situation. There's 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 diplomacy, and but it does it does still upset me that people are not brought to justice properly for the crimes they commit you know regardless of the the reasoning behind these these amnesties releases whatever you want to call it, it it's it is galling to think that people who committed such heinous crimes didn't didn't get their just desserts fully mm -hmm. yes and you see here and, and again i got to give credit to russ um this is not what the actual the color of the paperwork he he did a job. He is an extraordinary graphic artist. Really makes this thing pop. And yeah, just I mean, all he did was he just added some color, and it, it really looks pretty cool. So you see that uh, he was professor of English from Japan, and he he married. Uh, um, well, it doesn't say here. It just it gives his parents uh, Sue and Sugitaki. But um, by all accounts, he did marry and remained in Brazil, and he died, in, I believe it was in 1983, um, just recently discovered the year of his death. So he wow. lived a full life um, into his 70s and, um, again, ended up serving from the date of capture um, about 10 or 11 years. Wow. Mm -hmm. and then you see here, <laughs> this is the this particular document you'll see that uh is a list of all the reporters that were on board during the Hollandia operation you can see where up uh, united press saturday evening post yank and so forth is it's kind of interesting to see all those names on there mm -hmm. so it was being covered 
pretty well. So that's why we have, you saw Spencer's name in that first group. Yeah. And then here is uh, one of his articles that came out in the first week of October 1944, Almost Scouts Revived Chapter of the Old West, basically um, recounting McGowan's uh, first mission for the Alamo Scouts and, and Dove, which per, he performed a mission around Hollandia in June that goes down in the annals of uh, Scouts lore, you know, killed 33 Japanese, most of them with a coconut and a, and a canteen. So it, uh, the, the, the legends begin to grow of the Scouts. And, and eventually in June of 19. 19- 45, you can see they had their own feature story in, in the post. And there was uh, one in Saturday, that is the Saturday Evening Post, yep. and a couple other magazines. And basically, they just went silent for about 30 years after that. So what this what this really did it, to, to uh, encapsulate everything, you see the New Guinea and the, the so-called jungle missions, uh, 41 confirmed. I have a few more that I, I'm still working on, but as you can see, source material is kind of rough. 84 confirmed kills, 24 POWs. Uh, that 550 civilians, that's that's modest. Uh, 19 silver stars, 18 bronze, and four soldiers' medals. No man killed or captured. Um, but even, even just as important is that they really validated and re, or revalidated the concept of the Alamo Scouts and what they were doing. And if you look forward to what they did after that, they began working with uh, um, NEFIS, which is the Netherlands Foreign Intelligence Service. Immediately after the rescue of the nuns, they're, they're performing missions, uh, prisoner grabs and that sort of thing. They're helping um, uh, Dutch operatives on Romberpon Island recovering um, hundreds of civilians, which eventually led to the discovery of um, Dutch people living on or being held by the Japanese, which resulted in the Oren's Bari rescue, which on and on and on. And increasingly, the scouts began working on the, in the Philippines with uh, guerrilla coordination and, and training and arming and resupplying and then Cabanatuan. So it just kept growing and growing. And most of these missions led by men who were in their early 20s. And, and again, it, now that we've come full circle, it goes all the way back to the training they had under Bradshaw and and not being misused, being uh, used only for their purpose. And one side note on, on this Hobbs and Sambar mission, they were so angry. They had been, a colonel from the 41st was pressuring them to, to do combat patrols and they said, we would not. We are not going to do daylight combat control or combat patrols um, in this specific area. And he threatened to have them court-martialed. It's going to put them under arrest. And a, and a little storm blew up and they contacted Frederick Bradshaw, who was a very prominent attorney before the war. And all of a sudden, this all went away and the Alamo Scouts were cut loose to do what they did. So that's one of those wonderful little side stories that you come across in researching history. Here you can see this is actually from a, a file that I've discovered in the National Archives out, outlining some of the landings. So you see beginning with the Admiralties in 29 February 44, uh, the Alamo Scouts worked there. They operated Hollandi at Wadki, Biak, Nomfor, Sanzapur, conducted pre-invasion reconnaissance at, at all those places. So again, the, their role was ever expanding, um, all as a result of their uh, very good work in New Guinea, where the average mission lasted three days. On Leyte, it was 17 days. And then eventually into Luzon, some of their missions lasted uh, into, the, into the 60s and 70 day period. Wow. And I think, you know, we talked about it in the first show, Lance, and I want to re, you know, reiterate it now is it's the, sometimes we think of special forces in World War II as being a rather blunt tool. It's kind of killers, you know, and, and, and there's nothing wrong with that in a war environment. You need people to go in and do that. But it, to me, it's the, the, the Alamo Scouts 
um, exemplify this hearts and minds thing that became such a part in the 60s and 70s. Again, from the British point of view, I'm thinking about the SAS in Borneo, the SAS mm -hmm. in some of these places where it was about working with indigenous peoples. It was use of language, co connecting with people who have information who are from the area. It's not just going in and killing people and get out of again. It's not the dirty dozen. This, this, is, <laughs> this is something else. And I think Weirdly, because they didn't lose any men killed or captured, it's you know it's not like you can go and see these men in cemeteries overseas because they, they they didn't they didn't die in combat. So maybe they kind of dropped through the cracks a bit. But it, it it shows us that the Allies could be just as good at doing these covert intelligence things as, as we can the more as I say more direct blunt force type of missions that were very important as well. And but it's the Jedbra teams, things like that, where mm -hmm. setting up radios, things like that, and are perhaps overlooked a bit because they don't maybe incur the losses of some of the more, I say, blunt force. I don't mean that to be disrespectful towards sure. the SAS or the parachute regiment or the commandos, but they're, they're, it's a different type of special forces. And 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 I think this is this is we can see that in what special forces were doing in the next 20, 30, 40 years. That's the legacy you talked about at the beginning of the show that is so so and so important. So. In terms of what's going on, you because know, you, you've, you've said a few times during today's show, I've just found out this, I'm still finding out that, we got this recently. You know, you, you're not considering that your work on this subject is, is, is done. There's still, it's still clearly there are gaps in your research. There's missions that you want to kind of make official, so to speak. So, you know, obviously we talked about last time that the chance of meeting the veterans perhaps is 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 dwindling now, but there are family members, there's more archives being digitalized. So what are your hopes for the for the next the next chapter? Well, my hopes are that that the family members who've sent a lot of information, I mean God bless them. But one of the issues they don't know what they have. Every little piece, every every little note, every little photo that has a name scratched on the back, it all leads to another story and a missing piece. And it's like this gigantic crossword puzzle, or not actually jigsaw puzzle. Let's not say crossword, a jigsaw puzzle. And there's, but it's, the borders aren't clearly defined. There's always another edge. There's always another piece that can be added to this to help tell the story. And I've had many of the scouts tell me, this, we didn't record that. We were too busy going out trying to accomplish our mission. And John Dove once told me the last damn thing I want to do is come in from a, uh, a mission and sit at a typewriter for two hours up at headquarters. He said a lot mm -hmm. of times if something didn't really happen or there, there wasn't any prisoner taken or any combat, we didn't even record it. Well, as as you said, Lance, they're in their early twenties. They're thinking about yeah. girls and beer when they're not when they're not right. doing their job, as I was when I was in my twenties. <laughs> and 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 good on them, you know, that they mm -hmm. would they would have that. And it's it is the people of perhaps a little bit more years to do the actual piecing together of the history. And it's you know, it's it came up on a conversation that one of my other shows about a week or two ago about you know, people saying to this historian aren't there enough books about world war ii what is there still to find out and you you kind of when you hear that people say that i kind of roll my eyes and there's loads of things to work out i mean maybe not maybe there's some areas that don't need more work i mean do sure. we need another book on d-day says the man who lives in nomi do we need another book on market <laughs> garden but in terms of units like the alamo scouts and what people like grant harwood's doing with his study in romania and things like that there's there's on the Eastern Front and Japanese Chinese War. I mean, there's there's so many areas of World War II that we have only scratched the surface on. And I just hope that all of these units, Allied and Axis, end up finding themselves a Lance Zedrick to do that work to put all that flesh on the bones and put these unit histories together because it is in danger of being lost without the people putting the effort into the, I mean, the national archives will exist. Their stuff will sure. be there, but you've got to have someone to know what they're looking for. Be stubborn about going there and going through boxes. They weren't expecting to look at to find that information, pursue dead ends that don't end up bearing fruit to just get this history out there. And it's, in, it's important that, that we do because there are so many stories to go. Well, Paul, you said, and thank you for that, but, you said one thing that, that really rang <laughs> resonated with me is stubborn. Yeah. You know, and, and I've used this analogy 
people say, well, why do you keep doing this? I said, well, I'm like that little kid who puts his finger in a hole in a screen and I just, you know, I just put it in there one time and then, well, he just keeps getting bigger and bigger and I, I, the hole gets bigger and then I get my head in and then, and then I'm half my body's in and now, well, I got to go all the way because I'm this far in. So a lot of it's just refusing to, to stop. It's no great intellect or anything like that. It's, it's just uh, you catch fire with some kind of project like this and you want to see it to its culmination. And I don't know if there ever will be, but um, to your previous question, you'd mentioned about what my hopes are. Well, the officers of the Alamo Scouts, the team leaders, pretty much tapped out from their perspectives. You know, they, they kept the mission reports, decent notes, but it's the enlisted men where I get a lot of the information that, okay, there's a new, there's new smoke. There's a mm -hmm. fire. You know, they didn't have the voice, so to speak, as a, a as an enlisted man to write something in a mission report. And then you, well, you stayed with this family for, for three or four days. You were, you were hidden by this family and all of a sudden you got the name of the family and their people and, and so on. And then it grows wider. Then you, you research them and you find out they've published an account. Yeah. And then the mission has grown. And all of a sudden it what started as a three day mission with, with no activity also turned into a, to a situation where the team was, was hidden out by Filipinos for, for three days and fed and, 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 and really there's a lot of human stories in that. What we went over today with the missionaries, that's a movie waiting to happen. Absolutely. Yeah, no. It, it, I mean, so yeah. many layers to that cake. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, 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 you know, it, it, it this, this idea of there being stuff out there to find some of these enlisted men, maybe they didn't, write a diary maybe they just kept some notes somewhere maybe there's a scrapbook maybe there's something they told their son and and these connections can happen and for, for those who watched the the, the john Bazalone show yesterday and remember uh kurt who was watching well kurt uh, got in touch with brian dimitrovich and we, we now think his uncle may have been part of briggs's scout listening post on unkilled on october 25th in, in, in the gradle canal and that's simply by someone going on to youtube finding my channel was recommended them. the show came up they watched it they've made a connection and brian has now probably identified another member of this 30-man team and the, the, the family member has now in more information about his uncle's role and it's all because of youtube so mm -hmm. you, you never know where these little connections and things will happen and and you know there might be someone watching this maybe not today maybe someone will find it in a month's time who's searching something and they'll contact you or they'll contact me and they'll say, my grandfather did this. My, my grandmother has an archive of this and whatever, and it'll, it'll connect things. So, um, well, um, we could just yak on all day, but it's just, um, <laughs> I love talking to you, Lance, but as I've got a bit of a sniffy, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to bring it to an end. So I'll remind people what we were coming up and I'll say goodbye to you in a second. So folks, two shows tomorrow morning. So the first one's an odd time of day of World War II TV because we're coming to you live. I'm still here from Malaysia. So at 9 a.m. UK time tomorrow morning, I have a team of three historians, one in Singapore, one in Europe, and one on the ground in Malaysia or Malaya in World War II, bringing you to the uh, the history of the defense of Malaya, the ultimately unsuccessful defense of Malaya in 1942. So cameras on the ground in the jungle for Jungles Week, which is just amazing. Who would have thought a year and a half ago and I tried started this channel, we're going to bring you a live show from Malaysia. I wouldn't have thought it was possible technology providing it all works but that will be a brilliant show tomorrow then in the evening the incredible robert lyman is coming back on remember him from his show about um general slim and a uh, winget in burma week he's coming back on to talk about an incredible rescue operation uh, when a c-46 commando crashed in burma and they were among the headhunters well that'd be a great show tomorrow evening so, so don't forget to come back and watch those ones as always folks been a couple of questions in the sidebar there about Lance has written about the Alamo Scouts. His website details are in the description below. You can buy both his books from him direct. Uh, he's contributed to the newsletters of the association. All of the information, get in touch with Lance via his website below. As for us, don't forget to share what we're doing on Twitter, social media, Facebook. Please subscribe to the channel. Please click like. 
uh, consider becoming a patron to help us, me fund, do this stuff because I haven't had a proper job in a year and a half now. This is all I've got right now because there's no tours coming here because of that damn COVID thing. But right now, it just remains me to say thank you very much, Lance Cedric, and you are more than welcome to come back uh, on another occasion and expand on your knowledge because just your enthusiasm and passion for the subject is is fantastic. But, and then the archives and the photos, and thank you to Russ and the other members of the association for putting this work together because it's just extraordinary. I don't know people completely realize how exclusive and unique and how much work has gone into this presentation you're sharing with us free on our, on our on this channel it is incredible history you're getting here folks so um thank you very much for you to you lance um what are your plans for the rest of the sunday in uh in is it sunny there uh rainy rainy sunny hot rainy again <laughs> so <laughs> typical fall but uh thank you again paul for having me and and might i add um please everyone out there feel free to to go to the website uh to alamoscouts.org and and join our association. It's only $25 a year. And what it does is it funds our research trips yeah. to, to na the National Archives, which that information is not available unless your boots on the ground. Yeah, no, brilliant message there. And uh, mm -hmm. there are people here who I, I hope will, will, will take up that offer and go and get this. And, and you'll be helping you do your research and you'll be getting some great stories and be part of something that's honoring an incredibly unique and fantastic group of, uh, of, of, of this Unknown, little known American unit of World War II that you have highlighted their incredible deeds and bravery. So, well, there we are. We'll bring things in. So thank you very much. This is Paul Woodard for World War II TV saying thank you very much for your company this Sunday. I will see you all for the double bill of two shows tomorrow. Thank you, very everybody. I will see you all again. Bye now.